Hello, I'm Bill Smith, president of Willett. I hope you're safe and I hope you're well. Today is May 22nd, and as of today, over 1.6 million Americans have contracted COVID-19. 95,000 Americans have died. We don't know how many workers have died from acquiring COVID-19 on their job. We do know that COVID-19 has been spreading like wildfire in meatpacking plants across the country. We know that this disease is wreaking havoc on healthcare workers, first responders, law enforcement officers, and other essential workers. 50 years ago, in 1970, the Occupational Safety and Health Act was passed. The stated mission of OSHA is to ensure safe and healthful working conditions for working men and women by setting and enforcing standards and by providing training, outreach, and education and assistance. The head of OSHA is called the Assistant Secretary for Occupational Safety and Health. That position is vacant and has been vacant for some time. In response to the coronavirus, OSHA has issued guidance on preparing workplaces for COVID-19. This guidance document is filled with phrases of what employers should do, not what employers must do. In short, there are no mandatory regulations. On May 18th, the AFL-CIO filed a petition with the Federal Court of Appeals demanding that OSHA be required to issue emergency temporary standards to help protect workers from COVID-19. As AFL-CIO President Richard Trumka said, it's truly a sad day in America when working people must sue the organization tasked with protecting our health and safety. OSHA says there's no need for a temporary standard. Meanwhile, the National Council for Safety and Occupational Health reports the number of OSHA workplace inspections is down over 10%. OSHA has just 2,100, excuse me, 2,100 inspectors to inspect 8 million work sites. It would take 158 years to inspect each of them. The best way to avoid a worker's compensation claim is to promote safety. And it's time to promote safety in this country. Here at Willig, we remain steadfast in our push to make sure all workers across the country who contract COVID-19 on their jobs are covered under workers' compensation laws. This week, Wyoming became the latest, excuse me, the latest state to legislatively protect their workers. As I've told you before, presumptions for COVID-19 have come about in states in three different, excuse me, three different ways. By legislative action, by executive order, of a governor or by the emergency powers of a workers' compensation commission. The safest way to make this happen is through legislative action. Unfortunately, that's also, also the way it takes the longest to make it happen. Industry groups continue to fight against it. It was opposed by the attorney general in Canvas, Kansas. It was struck down by a court in Illinois over the rulemaking authority of the workers' compensation commission there. And in California, we're continuing to see pushback from Governor Newsom's order. The arguments against this are the same old arguments we see with everything. That there's going to be floodgates of litigation. Well, I can tell you that talking to my colleagues around the country, we're certainly not seeing that many calls from injured workers over COVID-19. Many of them, frankly, are scared to make a claim because of, of the thought of losing their job. The other argument we see is that insurance rates will go up. How many years have we heard that argument? Recently, NCCI had their annual symposium, and that annual symposium showed that profits for insurance companies continue to go up. Insurance carriers are sitting on billions of dollars in reserves. If you don't know, NCCI is the National Council on Compensation Insurance. They're the rate making bureau for 38 states. What this report showed was it confirmed 
a decade of falling insurance rates for employers while we're seeing skyrocketing uh, profits for insurance companies. You've heard, me you've heard me talk about it before, but we've had 30 years of cuts to injured workers' rights and benefits. The grand bargain is simply not much of a bargain for the injured worker anymore. So I ask this question again. If increasing rates, increasing insurance rates to employers are grounds to cut benefits to injured workers, why isn't a decade of falling insurance rates for employers and skyrocketing rates for workers' comp and insurance companies grounds to increase benefits to injured workers to maintain the balance of the grand bargain? Willie Warriors, I appreciate everything you do out there in the individual cases fighting for injured workers. I also appreciate your efforts in state capitals across the country to try to make sure that benefits are improved for injured workers and that workers are covered if they contract COVID-19 on the job. Keep up the fight, and I'll see you next week.